Resistance Burning Skies was one of the very first first-person shooters on the PlayStation Vita, and reviews at the time reflect that. Many of them were going through the honeymoon phase of having a real first-person shooter on the Vita, but I'm not here to have that experience, nor is that the question I'm asking. I'm here to ask, how good or bad is Resistance Burning Skies as a Resistance game? After all, if Resistance Retribution came out on the PSP, a far more gimped platform than the PS Vita, and that manages to be a fantastic Resistance experience, then there is clearly no excuses for this game. So let's see how good or bad Resistance Burning Skies is. Hey everyone, as always, Jarek here. Even making a video of this game has been years in the making. It's been a complete pain trying to get some way to record it. But before I explain why, we need to thank today's sponsor. Skillshare is an online learning community for people who like to be creative, where millions come together to learn how to improve their creative expression. Skillshare has thousands of classes for people who are creative and curious. There's topics on illustration, design, photography, videos, freelancing, and many more. So Skillshare is for the curious person that wants to learn more. Maybe you have a hobby you want to get into, but you just don't know where to start. Skillshare is here just for that. Skillshare has plenty of classes for all skill levels that will fit your schedule. Most are under 60 minutes and members get unlimited access to the site. The class I'm sharing with you today is a pixel art master course, beginner to expert freelance level for video games by Mislav. The reason I'm sharing this class with you is because there is a lot of 90s inspired retro first person shooters nowadays, especially with how popular GZ Doom is getting Pixel art is not going to be irrelevant anytime soon. Even if you just want to make your own fun little Doom wad, this will be helpful to know. So hey, if you want to try out Skillshare, the first 1,000 subscribers that click that link below get a one month free trial of premium membership. And as always, a huge thanks goes to Skillshare. I love what they do. If you want to get recorded from a PlayStation Vita, you have two options. The first option is to buy a PlayStation Vita and its proprietary memory card, then the games, then you need to hack your PS Vita so that you can output video from the USB cable, then plug in another cable to the audio jack, plug that into your PC so you can actually hear it, and then you're finally able to record PlayStation Vita footage. That's way too much money and way too much work for me to make literally three videos with the thing, so that's just not worth it and was off the table for me. That only leaves one way to get real footage from PlayStation Vita, and that is this. This little box, this thing, has been stopping me from recording two games, two highly requested games for years. This is a PlayStation TV. And yes, this is just a Vita in a box. It actually is this small. Hell, this thing is smaller than both my phone and my capture card. Why was this such a pain to get though? Well, I remember a time when it wasn't. The thing is, this is just a Vita in a box with an HDMI out, meaning it's pretty much just a Vita turned into a console. No one wanted that. No one wants a handheld in a box where they're forced to be stuck to a TV. If only they had some way to cleverly pull it from your TV to handheld mode whenever you wanted. Anyway, the thing absolutely did not sell, and I remember going on sale for only 20 bucks, seeing that in person and going, why would I want this? I'd rather just have the handheld, and boy do I regret doing that. Because now you can't find it for less than $300 because it's been discontinued. And that doesn't include the memory card and the games. That again is not worth it to make three videos, so... Well, I just had no way to record Vita games. I said this in a previous video, and I got an amazing response. That same day, I had about eight people message me saying, Hey, I have a PSTV. Can I loan it to you? I want to see these videos. And it's remarkably humbling to have so many people say, hey, we enjoy your content this much that we want to help get it done. To me, it's sort of a reminder of how much content like I make can mean to people. After all, if I make content that makes people forget the stress of their regular everyday life for 10 to 20 minutes every week, I consider that a job well done. Anyway, I just wanted to give a really big thanks to everyone that offered and a super big thanks to one of my viewers who goes by the name of Something Crispy. This is his PSTV. He loaned me the PSTV, loaned me a controller, loaned me the games, basically gave me everything I needed to make these videos. So again, a huge thanks goes out to him. Let's start with the graphics. Oof, this game is rough. Now, I know it's not meant to be seen on a 1440p screen, but even if you make it smaller, it still looks rough. There is an unreasonable amount of jaggies on screen at any given time. It makes the whole image kind of look like a mess. Textures are overall low quality and blurry. The whole game went back to that ugly, everything needs to be brown or gray aesthetic. There's just no colors at all. Animations are 
good enough, but not really great. But the worst offender is actually the audio. You remember when Reach came out and they were having all those audio issues, like guns sounded underwater and nothing sounded right? Yeah, well, that's what this game sounds like all the time. The gun sounds are extra offensive. As my Twitch chat said, sounds like a paintball gun. So yeah, audio is really not good. But to make things even worse, the frame rate is awful. Oh my god, the frame rate. Man, look at this. We have to be in the teens. Why is the frame rate so bad? This wasn't just a one-off experience. The frame rate will regularly dip when you try to play this game. And not just dipping slightly below 30 FPS, but I mean really dipping. So yeah, graphically it's bad. I'd be willing to look over the graphics being bad if it at least stayed at the solid frame rate and the audio wasn't as messed up as it is, but this isn't very good. Next, we'll move on to the story, and it fares a little better than the graphics, but that doesn't mean it's good. The concept behind the story is probably the most interesting part. This game takes place between Resistance 2 and Resistance 3. Resistance Burning Skies takes place during the fall of America. And again, that is an interesting concept. You get to see the Chimera's first steps into North America. You play as a fireman who is so forgettable that I don't even remember his name. Anyway, the game starts with you going to put out a fire. Well, within the very first few minutes, the Chimera show up. And the main character, who is just a fireman, immediately picks up this alien weapon and seems like a god with it. Now, this isn't the first time video games have done this. I mean, Gordon Freeman immediately comes to mind. However, unlike Half-Life, it doesn't slowly build up till you're basically a scientist god that's ridiculously good with guns. No, you're basically just the only fireman that for some reason is just really good with guns. And once you're out of this burning building, you just sort of join military ranks taking on the enemies for reasons. Okay, the real reason is that you're trying to meet back up with your family. You got separated and your family went on to evac with the rest of the civilians. And from the main character's side, that's basically the whole plot. All he's trying to do is regroup with his family. However, there's a little bit more going on. About 80% of the way through the game, you find out that the US government is trying to control the Chimera. Yeah, because that's what this needs. Why have a plot like that? This seems laughably out of place for a resistance game. You already have well-established lore. The Chimera are supposed to be terrifying. Why do this? It even ends with an evil scientist making some huge creature abomination that, shocker, doesn't listen to him, and then that's the final boss of the game. The thing that really bothers me with this is that it just doesn't fit in a Resistance game. It's kind of like all the cult stuff in Silent Hill that no one actually cares about or wants anything to do with. They care more about Silent Hill. It's just kind of awkwardly there. Except for that's written way better, so it's not like that at all. This isn't to say that the writing is so bad that it's hard to follow and the story itself is, like, really, really bad. It's more mediocre than anything else. The problem is this is a resistance game and it just doesn't work with resistance. So let's move on to actually playing the game. And once again, I need to talk about controls for numerous reasons. So the PS Vita was the first handheld that had two analog sticks. You'd think that a first person shooter would be able to do this perfectly fine. No, they didn't. The PS Vita also had a touchscreen, and since this is a new, hot handheld, they wanted to show that off. So there's a bunch of unnecessary touch controls that didn't need to be there. If you know me, you know I hate stupid gimmicky controls. You have two analog sticks, get the touchscreen out of here. Hell, I'm the same type of person that really thinks motion controls made Skyward Sword so much worse of a game. I mean, the rest of Skyward Sword also being a bad Zelda game doesn't help. Don't at me. Anyway, let me explain these controls. Now, the basic twin stick controls are there, moving with the left analog stick, aiming with the right. The face buttons do things that you would expect, reload, swap weapons, jump, crouch. The left trigger aims, the right trigger shoots. Where the touchscreen controls come in is with very specific actions. For example, in order to melee, you need to press the axe button in the bottom right of your screen. Okay, minor nuisance, but whatever. Or if you want to throw a grenade, you need to press that grenade button and drag it over the screen where you want to throw it. Why? Or if you want to use alt fires, they all function on touchscreen controls. If I want to fire a grenade out of my assault rifle, I need to let go of the right analog stick, press on the touchscreen, and then release to shoot where I'm pressing. To make things worse, the action button is also the touchscreen. If I want to open a door, I have to press the touchscreen. If you manage to not end up opening that door, you just use your alt fire against the wall and waste ammo. Like, I hate this shit. Just make X open the door. To make things worse, they could have totally made this work with the D-pad. Here's what the D-pad does. 
Down on the D-pad sprints, that's fine, but left, right, and up on the D-pad have you lean around corners and peek up over cover. You didn't need any of this, pressing the aim button still has me aim over cover anyway. You could have bound all of that D-pad to things way more useful. If I want to use an alt fire, just press up on the D-pad and then swap over to the alt fire and then I can aim normally. If I want to throw a grenade, press right on the D-pad and then pull the grenade out to throw it. Or just give me an option to turn the touchscreen shit off, it adds nothing to the game. What's even more baffling is that the PS Vita has some sort of touch sensor on the back of it, but it doesn't utilize this. That would have been way easier than having to use the touchscreen in front. For example, with the auger, if you want to put the shield out, you need to press two thumbs on the screen and push different directions. This is very awkward, but you can easily do that on the back without a problem. Again, I hate gimmicky controls. Just give me a regular control scheme. So how are the regular controls then? Well, at first they seemed really bad. Aiming felt delayed and awkward. The best way I can describe it is, you know that feeling in a first person shooter when you're running on ice, how it takes a few seconds for you to really catch up speed and then a few seconds for you to stop? That's what aiming felt like. That was until I went into the options and just turned aim acceleration off and then it felt a lot better. I would highly advise to do this if you plan on playing this game. That still raises the problems that now you have no aim acceleration on a controller where you would prefer to be able to fine tune that because unlike a mouse and keyboard, having aim acceleration is actually kind of a good thing with a controller when it's done right. To make all this even worse for me, I was not playing on a PS Vita, I was playing on a PS TV. Now, I don't have a PS Vita on me, so pretend this PSP is a Vita. Touchscreen controls are very annoying and gimmicky, but a little more doable in this configuration. Yeah, well, I wasn't doing this though. A PS TV is basically just a console, which means you're using a controller. So that means all the touchscreen stuff I had to do, I had to use this pad up here, which makes it even more awkward. It didn't really hinder anything. I could still do what I needed to do in game, but it made my thumbs not feel very good. Moral of the story is they finally developed a handheld with two analog sticks and decided touchscreen support was the best way to go. But okay, enough rambling about the controls, let's talk about the gameplay. Unfortunately, while this game looks like Resistance, it really doesn't feel like Resistance. Like it has Resistance enemies of numerous types and it has a lot of Resistance weapons and these weapons are still really cool. The bullseye can still do that lock onto enemies so you can shoot around walls thing. The auger is still an awesome gun that shoots around walls and can make a shield. They replaced the sledgehammer with an ax that is ridiculously deadly. My god. Why is the, the axe that strong? What did they put in this axe? How strong is this man? They gave you a minigun with a heat wave alternate fire that just destroys people. And by far the best thing of all is the shotgun, which is actually so badass, it's significantly better than the shotgun you would actually get in the other resistance games. <laughs> it even has a makeshift incineration crossbow on the top of it. Like, that's awesome. Honestly, if I was to redo my best shotguns list video that I made forever ago, you can watch that in the top right over there. I would probably throw this shotgun into that list. It's that good. This is after the gun has been upgraded, by the way. The upgrade system is very simple. You find these blue cubes and then you can upgrade your guns in this menu. You can choose one thing from the left and one thing from the right. So two upgrades per gun. And in order to select the upgrades, you have to navigate using the stupid touch screen. Why do I have to spin this cube? Why add this gimmicky shit? Just let me select the stuff in a menu. However, all of this doesn't really apply to a great or fun experience because the enemy are a massive letdown. The map design is a cover shooter. You walk into a room, there's a bunch of chest high walls, you shoot a bunch of enemies that are brain dead and don't do anything but stand behind cover and occasionally pop out to shoot you or stand in the open shooting at you. The final result is that the game feels less like resistance to play and more like Call of Duty to play. This is another lesson as to why AI really matters. This is one of the pillars of the original fear and that's one of the biggest reasons why the original fear is still fun to this day. If you do AI wrong, no matter how interesting these enemies are, they're just not gonna be that fun. The game also suffers from some truly terrible pacing. I'll take the words from one of the Bungie devs. They were watching a speed run of Halo Comet Evolved. And on the library level, one of them said, Hey, this is just yeah. too long. Like the mission feels over like 45 minutes ago. And those words perfectly explain this game. This game is only around four hours long, but it just feels like it lasts 
so much longer than that. Every level feels like it drags on more than it needs to. It starts getting very repetitive very quick. You walk into a room, there's a bunch of chest high walls, enemies walk out, a clown closets, you shoot them, you keep going, you do it over and over again. It doesn't really mix things up or do anything to keep my attention, it's just that for four hours. The closest thing they did to mixing it up was having a scientist suddenly get contaminated and be a bullet sponge for seemingly no reason. This is one of the red flags I found in bad games. When there's a boss, that's a boss for the sake of being a boss. There's no reason for them to have more health. You can't see them wearing any armor. You don't know why they take a million bullets to kill. They just do. And then this mini boss turns into a regular enemy that you have to kill way more times later on. But before you even get the chance to do that, you need to escape out of this facility. And that requires you literally just running by enemies, ignoring them as they shoot at you to make it under doors before they close. And then you slowly die in fire if you don't make it. Yeah, again, that's another red flag. This is something I notice a lot of bad games do. The bosses aren't any more entertaining either. For these bosses, you can basically ignore damage from other things in the room and you'll be fine. I had a few people in my chat tell me that the final boss was pain and more difficult than it should be, but no, I killed it first try without really breaking a sweat. I literally just pulled out my chain gun and shot its weak points and then the game ended. Yeah, it's rather anticlimactic. I'm probably making this game seem a lot worse than it is. In all reality, it's just a painfully mediocre first person shooter. The thing is, I'm looking at it as a resistance game and resistance deserves way better than this. Again, reviews on launch were more positive than they should have been just because they were one of the first first person shooters on the PS Vita and that seemed like a cool gimmick at the time. I have a truly powerful handheld, I can play a shooter on it now. However, that doesn't excuse it from being a painfully mediocre game that's just not very good. This was the last Resistance game we got in the franchise, and with that, I played all of them. But it's a bit of a bittersweet ending. As I said, Resistance deserved better. But for now, I think that's all I have to say. I want to give a big thanks to everyone that joined me over on Twitch while I stream this game. My Twitch is twitch.tv slash Jarek for Gaming Dragon. If you subscribe, you get to see my videos ahead of time. Thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. This will be the last sponsor you see from Skillshare for quite a while. So if you want to check that out, be sure to check the link down below in the video information. Again, this is your last chance. And of course, a big thanks goes to you for watching this video.